Hello, Bendy Bono here, ready to talk to you about question four of the Summa Theologica on the perfection of God. This one is a bit shorter and less dense than what we've seen so far, so we get to tackle the entire question today. Uh, just three articles in this one. So let's not waste any time. Let's get right to it, and uh, we'll go over to the screen capture. Let's go. All right, here we are, Prima Pars, Treaties on the One God. We have finished the question of whether God exists, question two, and now we are in how God exists. We have finished the divine essence. We have finished the simplicity of God. That was question three. Now we move on to the perfection of God, which is going to be questions four through six. First, we consider the perfection of God as a single question. Then in questions five through six, we will look at the issues of divine goodness. So question four, we'll look at that. We don't have any definitions this time. So if you've been struggling to figure out, you know, all this stuff that we've been talking about, you know, essence, existence, genus, all that stuff, well, some of those terms are going to apply today, but we aren't going to pile on any new ones. Three articles here, whether God is perfect, whether the perfections of all things are in God, whether any creature can be like God. Now, like what we saw in the simplicity of God, where we asked, does God have a body? This is one of those where I think a lot of people would say, well, why are we even spending time on this? Why, why do we worry about whether God is perfect? Of course God is perfect. Well, you know, it's fine if we want to take that as a given. Uh, and I think you can live a, a full and fulfilling life in faith, taking that as a given. But the goal of the Summa isn't to take anything as a, at a given. It's to dig into all of this and say, okay, let, let's examine the reasons for this and why, what issues might somebody raise against it. So what are those issues? What would be the objections to saying God is perfect? Well, we actually have some pretty interesting ones in here. So three objections. First, perfect things are those that are completely made. In other words, you know, things that have been made in such a way that they lack nothing. That's perfection. God is not made. Therefore, God is not perfect. Two, the beginnings of things are not perfect. You know, in other words, uh, when something, when a creation first starts, it has to grow into its perfection. So, the acorn is not the perfect oak tree. You know, it, it has to grow into that. God is the beginning of everything. Therefore, God is not perfect. You could probably even push that stronger and say, therefore, God is decidedly imperfect based on that reasoning. And God's essence is his existence. We saw that in question three, article four. And you'll notice that we, like I, I've talked about in the intro, we assume the knowledge from previous articles and questions. So uh, some of our objections and some of the arguments will be formed on things we've already looked at. Existence is imperfect because it is universal and modifiable. It, it's all over the place. Everything has existence. Therefore, God is not perfect. Right? Anything that's changeable, the way existence is, anything that is universal cannot be perfect. Argument from authority, Matthew 5.48, the verse, Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Open and shut case from the perspective of Scripture. Argument. A thing is perfect in proportion to its actuality, since the perfect thing lacks nothing. Okay, so going back to objection one here. Something is perfect that is completely made. Aquinas is taking that idea but rewording it. He's saying the perfect thing is that which is act fully actualized, that has no potential that has not been actualized. Remember we've talked about potential potency and actuality. That's the key idea underlying this. Were God the first material principle, he would be pure potency, and therefore most imperfect, because the material exists as potential. However, God is the first principle, proof two, and he is pure act, proof one. Therefore, he is most perfect, because again, the perfect thing is that which is fully actualized. God is pure act. We saw that in the first proof back in question two, article three. Therefore, he must be most perfect. Answering our objections, 
Created things are called perfect when they are brought from potentiality into actuality. Therefore, perfection signifies that which is not wanted in actuality. So he's essentially just making explicit uh, what he implicitly did here at the start of the argument. Reply to two, our beginnings come from states of potentiality and are brought into actuality. That's why, for us, the beginnings of something lack perfection. Uh, they, they, the beginning of something, by definition, exists in a state of po potentiality, or many states of potentiality. But that's not true of God, Go, uh, God, because he is absolute primality, he is absolute actuality. Three, exist existence is most perfect since it is that which brings something from potentiality into actuality. Okay, so, uh, again, a lot of the argument here is focused on the fact that God is pure act. God lacks nothing in terms of his actuality. That's how we can say that he is perfect. All right, Article 2. Whether the perfections of all things are in God. A few objections here. God is completely simple. We saw the question 3, Article 7. Perfect things are many and diverse. Therefore, all perfections are not in God. In other words, perfections are too complex to exist wholly in a simple being, such as God. Two, oppositions, our opposites, cannot coexist. The perfections of different things may be opposites, therefore they cannot all exist in God. You know, so perfect blackness as a color is going to be different than the, the polar opposite of perfect whiteness, therefore they can't all exist in God. Number three, life is more perfect than existence. Knowledge is more perfect than life. God's essence is existence, therefore he contains the perfection of existence, but not of life and knowledge. Otherwise we would say God's essence is life and knowledge. Argument from authority. Dionysius, who we're going to see a lot of in these last two articles, tells us that God prepossesses all, all things. Argument. God is said to be universally perfect because he lacks no perfection. Fair enough. Uh, we're just kind of restating the proposition. Any perfection in an effect must pre-exist more perfectly in the cause. God is the first efficient cause, proof two. Therefore, all perfections must pre-exist most perfectly in God. In other words, all effects, everything, flows out of the first cause. God, and because a perfection in an effect must exist first in a cause, the perfections of all things must be traced back to God as the first cause. And this is the Via Eminentia. That's something we talked about during the intro on the treatise on the One God, if you need a refresher on that. Then things are perfect insofar as they have some form of being. God as self-subsisting being contains all the perfections of being. This goes back to the potential actuality thing. Pure being is pure actuality. Therefore, all perfections are in him. Because as the first existing being, he is pure actuality, total actuality, actuality itself. Therefore, any perfection, which is a form of actualization, cannot not exist in God. Objections answered. We answer the first two at once. God contains all perfections, not as they are in things, but eminently. This allows him to have all perfections without damaging his simplicity, and we could add to that without having to be contradicted by opposite perfections. Because we are seeing, when we, we talk about the perfections of things, we're talking about perfections that are in effect that is ultimately derived from God as the first efficient cause. Our perfections are effects caused by his singular perfection. That's how we get around the contradiction piece. That's how we get around the complexity piece. Reply to three. Participated existence does not need to contain all the perfections of existence. In other words, the way we exist, we can exist and have existence. We can participate in existence without being perfect in every way of existence. Therefore, beings with participated existence, that would be us, all creatures, can lack some perfection of existence. 
But God, as being itself, as actuality itself, cannot lack any perfection of existence. Again, why? Because he is pure actuality. He must have all actualizations, all perfection. And that includes life and intelligence. So when we say God is existence, God is being itself, what we are saying is that he not only has the perfection of existence in the way that objection three was referring to, but he has the perfection, he, he has all the perfections of actuality, including the perfection of life, including the perfection of intelligence. Then question three, can any creature, or article three, can any creature be like God? Psalm 85, eight tells us that none among the gods are like, are like God. That should be singular. If any beings could be like God, it would be those called gods. Since they are not like him, neither are we able to be. Now we can take that in kind of the polytheistic way that maybe St. Thomas is intending it, or we could say that that verse in scripture could also be applied to whatever we consider to be the highest order of created being. And so whatever that is, whether we label it gods or our humanity, if that's what we, we think, or, or, or whatever, uh, that scripture verse is affirming for us that the high, you, uh, you think of the absolute highest created being, and that isn't like God. All right? So, objection two things in different genus cannot be compared. God is contained in no genus. We saw that article five, question three. Therefore, we are not comparable to him and cannot be like him, because to compare ourselves to God, he would be, have to be part of the same genus as us. Like things agree in form, they have the same form. Right? Something we talked about in question three when we discussed form and matter, Aristotle's five co four causes. Nothing can agree with God in form, since his form is distinct in having its existence as its essence. We saw that question three, article four. Then likeness is mutual. If a creature is like God, God is like that creature. And Isaiah 40, 18 tells us that's not allowed. God is not like any creature. So that seems like a pretty strong case. Let's see what St. Thomas has to say against it. First, argument from authority, Genesis 126. The obvious one, God has made in man's image that implies a form of likeness. And then even more explicitly, 1 John 3, 2 says that when he appears, we shall be like him. So for as logically sound as this might appear, scripture says something very different. Let's find out how we reconcile that with rationality. All right, the argument. When a cause produces an effect that is not in its own species, there is a generic or analogous likeness. Okay, so what do we mean by that? When a cause produces an effect that is not in its own species, when you, you know, if you have a child, you have caused an effect in your own species. But not all causes and effects are within their own species, obviously. And St. Thomas gives this analogy. The effects of the sun, heat, light, you know, all that good stuff, are not in the species of the sun. The heat that the sun produces, its effect, is not the sun itself. It is an effect of the sun. Those effects don't receive its form. They don't have the form of the sun but are said analogically to be like the sun. You know, we understand a likeness between them. We understand a relationship between them. God is the first principle of all being. All existence has this analogous likeness with all creatures that participate in being. In other words, all creatures that exist, that is, all creatures, are like God in the way that sunlight, uh, that warmth from the sun is like the sun itself, analogically. Why? Because God is being itself. Our existence, our being, is an effect of his being. Therefore, we have that same analogical likeness to him. Now, you'll notice we didn't get into what do we mean when we talk about uh, man being made in the image of God. Uh, that's because right now we're looking at these questions from 
the perspective of God. We're trying to figure out God and figure out what we can say about God. Later in the Summa, we'll talk about creatures, creations, and then we'll, we'll look at this more from the perspective of mankind. But right now, we're not trying to understand mankind. We're trying to understand God as best as we can, which, of course, as we've talked about, is imperfectly. Objections answered. Apply to one. According to Dionysius, Things can be simultaneously like and like, unlike God. Like in that they imitate him, unlike in that they fall short of him. So, Psalm 85.8 is talking about that second type of likeness. We fall short of God. The most eminent of creatures fall short of God. We can be like him in other ways, but we are still unlike him, just as the psalm says. Reply to two. This is true of creatures in different genus but not true of God, who transcends every genus. Okay? And that's referring to creatures that are in different genus. And then, three, the like, like things agree in form, but nothing can agree with God in form, since his form is distinct and having its existence as its essence. Okay? And down here, according to Dionysius, you know what? I forgot to answer Number three, and I filled that in as number four. That's why this isn't making sense as I'm saying it out loud. I apologize for that. Likeness is, well, let's move on to four for the moment. Likeness is mutual. If a creature is like God, God is like that creature. We saw that as the objection. According to Dionysius, mutual likeness applies to things of the same order, but not when comparing cause to effect, okay? Which is what we're talking about when we're talking about God. All right, for number three, uh, I messed up there, I apologize. Let me go into Garajou Lagrange and see what he has to say here. Uh, and then I will add it to the outline later for when you are looking at this. All right, he is going to say uh, answer to the third objection, which is like things agree in form, but nothing can agree with God in form since his form is distinct and having its existence as its, ex as its essence. Garajou Lagrange in his commentary says, likeness, of, and I'm quoting directly from him here, since I didn't write anything down, likeness of creatures to God is therefore solely according to analogy, inasmuch as God is essential being, whereas other things are being by participation. In other words, this would apply if we were talking about other forms of likeness, but since we're talking about an analogical likeness, that does not apply, and I will get that fixed on the outline, uh, so you can go back and um, review that without all my confusing dribble that I, I just uh, gave to you in trying to cover up my mistake there. So that's it for the perfection of God. Next time we will take on the goodness of God in question five. I believe we start with goodness in general. Oh, well, maybe. Of question five and six, one of them concerns the goodness of God, one concerns goodness in general. Uh, question five is six articles long, so I'm going to kind of dig into that and see if I want to break it in half or not. I'm thinking we probably will because these have gotten pretty long already, uh, so we'll probably only take the first three articles of that next time. But in any case, uh, happy reading with the Summa, and thanks for watching, and I will be back with you in a couple of days with question five. Goodbye.